<laughs> yeah, that, so you were the one who translated that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, awesome. yeah. He did it word by word. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I made a script uh, to work with uh, Google Translate. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. There you go. Okay, so this next hour, we're going to be talking about the best programming approaches and when to use them. Um, let me start off this with the poll, which I wrote again really quickly. Um, here, here we go. So I'm curious for people here. Um, hey, I see your fan. All right, he's the author of the uh, Rafidium. Um, yeah, there we go. So yeah, when it comes to just writing stuff in auto hockey in general, you know, do you which one do you do mostly? Do you send? Are you send acting like a human, sending mouse clicks and keystrokes and whatnot? Are you taking more of an API approach, a programmatic approach, um, or are you doing a bit of both, depending on what it is that you're working with? Um, meanwhile, so this is where I think it's going to be a great conversation with. Um, some, especially, you know, Maestri has been working with me for years doing stuff and, and, and with the Zayas too, and Tank also, we've all done a lot of crazy stuff. And I know Geek Dude as well has worked in a lot of different ways. So, you know, how do you approach a given topic? You know, what are the things you take into account? Like, first off, if you're writing a script for someone, what's your first thing you jump to? Because there's a lot of different dimensions we got to take into account, right? Like one is just who's going to support the script. Yeah, you know what I mean, on an ongoing basis. But what are other things you guys think about? Anyone want to chime in here? I guess it's only also important if you yeah want to have a user uh, using the PC when the script is running. Sure. Right. Yeah. Is a human going to be using the code? Right. Because if you're imitating humans. Um, if you're taking that approach, it, it can be very, you know, problematic. You got to understand that. Now, another big one for me is just understanding how many computers it's going to be run on, right? Uh, Joe, can you unmute? Uh, uh, yeah, Maestrith and oh, Maestrit, yes. whoever. I've tried. I mean, I've I've sent before. I guess maybe once you meet yourself. Oh, yeah, I had muted like myself that. and it yeah, won't when you mute yourself. Mute yeah, that's right. It does that history. <laughs> Um, so, personally, it's, it all has to do with how many people, how many are going to be using the code. Is it going to be used on one machine? Is it going to be used on multiple machines? If it's, if it's multiple machines and everything else, then you pretty much have to try to use the, any API, if at all possible, because APIs are usually, you know, network aware and multiple people can use them all at the same time. I really don't, I, I try to just use like keystrokes and mouse clicks and everything else as little as possible, just because it's so unreliable. Any kind of API or directly interfacing with a database online is always going to be preferred. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me. We got quite a distribution as far as the answers in the poll. Actually it was, yeah, it is very surprising. I was not um, surprised. Yeah, I was not expecting that. Uh, Tank, you were trying to say something, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, I, I guess most of my experience has been more in a corporate environment with this particular mm -hmm. question. Um, and uh, I apologize, I am up and being mobile right now because uh, I had a delivery at the door. Uh, can everybody hear me just fine? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so. What? Right now, what I would say is like, in general, for me, I am very similar to Chad in that sense of uh, whenever I can avoid using clicks, moving the mouse or the keyboard, I would definitely avoid that whenever possible. That's kind of like my last resort. Now, what would, what's the reason why is it 
like Dimitri brought up a really good point of it, hey, if the person it prevents a human from using the computer at the same time, right? That's that's one reason why, but there's a couple other reasons why you would make that preference, Isaias. Well, right. yeah, of course. There's a, a few situations in which sending keystrokes, uh, basically you have to be aware where you're sending those keystrokes because if for some reason the window where you were sending it to changed, now you're sending keystrokes to something to, totally unrelated to what you want to automate and stuff like that. So that means that your code has to keep track of many other variables other than just knowing that you are uh, sending to the correct location. So I, I just don't like to use it just to remove the variables of what happens if the window goes into the background? What happens if somebody, if a pop-up that I was not expecting, you know, the antivirus pop-up gets in front of the window, what happens then? What happens if, you know, the, the, the user moved the mouse? Those kind of things. I, I try to remove those variables from my automation as much as I can. I'm sorry, Tank. Sorry about that. that you, yeah, it seems like yeah, you Somehow right. so I got maybe... muted again. Okay. Um, so um, uh, anyway, so as I was saying, you know, my, my situation has mostly been in a uh, corporate environment. So um, uh, you know, I, I think all of us who've been doing this for a while are, are on the same page about let's avoid mouse and keystrokes because Fundamentally, it just doesn't work. You know, I, I do look for a, you know, a com interface or UIA or, or something that will interact directly with a window uh, if I have to use a user interface for the automation. But, um, you know, I, I think I think it often gets overlooked that um, people will ask for automations and not really know, not really understand what it is they can get, let alone what they should get. Um, so there, there, there kind of needs to be an education process with, um, we'll just call them your customer, even if it's your, like your best friend, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, there kind of has to be an education session where you you sit down and you walk through what they're asking for, but but you mainly execute and you, you have this interactive dialogue, you know, where does this come from? Where does it go? um and why and um and you have to help re kind of remold their image or idea of what it is that they were asking for yeah that is right now well, uh, what, what i was gonna say was it and, and trust me you, you, I think everyone here probably knows who I am, whatever. I'm, I'm no quote unquote programmer, right? But I've done a lot of stuff with an API approach. Honestly, actually, people come to a lot of our events wanting to send keystrokes. I, because I refuse to, to take that approach just because of how inconsistent and unreliable, especially if you're sharing with other people on other computers, it was, I never learned really how to do that. Not, not much, not more than a hot key or a hot string to, you know, send some simple stuff. Um, but it's it's one of those things that like often people who work in auto hotkey like let's say they go on fiverr and they find someone to do something the the person solving the problem isn't even aware tank that's my point is like you know so not only is it like be careful who you get when you're having someone work on your code and again i'm not knocking if it's what you got you know and you got to do it yourself sending i and i send keystrokes occasionally but it's just, it breaks so fast and to Zayas's point too, of like making sure you're in the right window and this and that, or do I have to dedicate a whole other window somewhere where I don't, I don't <laughs> put anything in front of it. I don't do anything with it. Um, you not know, only that, not only you know. that, it's also human error. I remember we developed a little script for somebody and as we were not able to use the API as we wanted to, we had to do something very specific. And I told the guy, look, and I made a video, I made a video, I said, look, when you open the Chrome window, make sure that you only have one tab open. And also make sure that you don't have three Chrome windows open, right? Because if you have multiple tabs with what we were doing, it is not that it was gonna fail, but it could fail. And I didn't want to have that particular thing. He said, yeah, perfect, no, I, no, no problem. Then, <laughs> few days later, he goes ahead and says like, hey, your script breaks very often. I'm going to send you a video of what I'm doing. 
and the <laughs> when he shares the video, the first thing he has is like one, two, three windows open, and all, all of them had like 20 tabs open. And I'm like, I specifically explained that that would happen if you had so many. So removing the human interaction from the automation is the best you can do. But the problem is when you're sending keystrokes or moving the mouse, it's really difficult for you to remove the user interaction from the automation without totally letting the user like not use the computer. Well, the, the, <laughs> the, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in, the, in the events, the rare events that I've done it, I, I've insisted on block input. Yeah. Yeah, which is easy to do as well, right? But right. yeah. I don't like it because uh, once I needed to restart my computer and now I don't use block input anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you found yourself that you cannot do anything with it. So block input is 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 kind of like a solution, but I usually think uh if you and I would suggest if you're going to go ahead and simulate sending keystrokes and those kind of things, um make sure that you either block just when you're going to send the input, not all the time, just when you're just going to send it and then unblock it right away so that the user right. does not feel the, 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 the heat of not being able to use the computer. But still, that is not a good solution, but there is something that it has to its advantage. It's really quick. Anybody can just go ahead and say, send, control, enter, ABC, and that's it. You know, so that's the well. <laughs> so, so like, there's another tactic to that though, too. Like, you can put whatever you're sending in to the clipboard and send a control V. But yeah, that's a good way of just not having to. And send then that's even quicker. Things. Okay. Yeah, I actually responded. I don't, I don't know if I've seen Matthew here yet. He made a post on LinkedIn. It was I thought it was really cool on LinkedIn. He posted how he has a hot string. Which which dumps in text when people instant message him on LinkedIn, you know, and it's all the salesy crap, right? And he he had written this hot string that basically sends, you know, while I appreciate connecting to people, I really hate you know salesy messages. Um, and he was he was sending it using the send command, and it was a long thing. And I basically said, to him, I said, you know, this is awesome, but you know, for stuff with long text, I will copy it to the clipboard and then just send a paste. Um, and mm -hmm. of course out of sleep um you know of 100 milliseconds and then restore the clipboard after um otherwise you end up sending your first clipboard which was really a bug not a bug but um, a little bummer that took me a long time to figure out but um <laughs> yeah and it's so much faster and in you know more consistent of, and, and it'll work in almost any editor but yeah the the other big one i'd say is which is as you kind of alluded to it is hey you know one is do i need this right now do i need this in the next five minutes you know, sometimes you have something where, like, you know, I had Maestri at first and, and Isaiah's help with it, you know, create, automate my task for doing stuff based off of an image search and sending text. I almost never use the tool unless I have a very quick thing. I just need to get done. And it's kind of a one and done. You know, it's not something I'm going to keep forever. I'm like, you know what? It's great for that, right? I can very quickly go you know, find something, click on it or send text to it and do whatever. It's awesome for that, right? It's great. But if I'm going to do something 100,000, well, first off is how many times am I going to use it? And the next one is what's the rep repetition of it? You know, then you start talking about should it be efficient besides reliable, besides logging errors? You know, when there is an error, I know GeekDude earlier mentioned something about API calls and being able to programmatically detect that something went wrong and, you know, capture your error uh, and then, you know, log stuff about it. I, I would say basically we have to divide stuff into quick and reliable so then you have these two camps you have well, you need something very quick yeah. and easy to maintain well then just use the send command i would fair I enough would, fair yeah enough. i would definitely just use I've, send input right <laughs> well, and then there are some and that's why to me calm is one of those things if there's a calm object that can be both, right? You yeah. can't very quickly write some stuff with calm with Excel 
And that's, I would put that one on the reliable end. Like you need it to always work. I would go with com instead of a, but again, to your point, the com is not only reliable, it's really fast. It can be in, in, right. in order to write the code. Is that, we're talking about writing the code or actually executing the code? Well, basically uh, kind of like a mixture of both. Like if you need something done fast, like uh, I need a script for today and I need it to work, then, then I would go ahead and create some send commands. If I need it to be actually reliable, I would use com. And, and, and the reason why I wouldn't uh, say that com is fast is just because sometimes com has a learning curve. If you haven't used a com object before, or if you- Which is a really good point. Right, right. If, you don't, if you don't know what options you have available, you might take longer and when I was referring about the speed, it's about the coding speed. Which, which is another really good example of, hey, what if there's already a lot of um, libraries or things out there built in this language and examples of doing what I want to do? Well, then I might even just use what's available. I can set that is right. right. That is right. So, and actually talking about those type of things, like the ACC library is one of those. Uh, for Auto Hotkey version one, you have this ACC library that allows you to pick inside programs and uh, see where the controls are located at and actually interact with the controls of a program. If you need something fast and reliable, and there is the ACC library out there. Let's not forget the that. UIA. Descalada is on the call, man. Oh, Descalada is here. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know what? The, the, the UIA, which is kind of like very similar to the ACC library, kind of like the superset of the ACC library, is another way that you can uh, interact with the program. But again, then there is this learning curve. Send input is easy. You send input, enter, and that's it. Actually sending an enter key to using the UIA library is a little bit different. And there's a few things that you have to keep into account. Uh, and, and But my preference, whenever I can, I would use the UIA library instead of using the send input because it's more reliable. That's what happens. Uh, regarding COM, I actually have a question. If you have a program and you don't know if it has uh, COM options, is there a way to quickly get to see what methods there are for that COM object? Yes. That's interesting. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I don't know off the top of my head who who wrote it. I don't remember. Um, uh, but but there is a a com inspector GUI as uh, that's um, uh, loaded with a tool that's out there, Auto GUI or something like that. Um, but um, so I I I, I kind of pirated that a while back and. Um, um, so I, I, I may have, um, and, and it's by no means, uh, perfect yet. Um, but I, I may have, um, uh, uh, built a, a kind of a, um, uh, tool, if you will, that, um, um, may take a you know say internet explorer dot application and auto build you a class for it um i'm trying to find a copy of, of where i think i, I, I think uh, i think joe is sending kind of like a copy of that particular script right yeah, well it's the page i have a com page and in it um take a while back i asked you for the one that you had done mm -hmm. uh i think yeah it's the letter s <laughs> <laughs> up here at the bottom of the downloads but i think that was the one that you know at least when we had talked about it that was the the one for peeking into the the calm class stuff now that um, is one of the things and again when we are kind of like choosing when when, when joe and i we, we talk to somebody and they are they need some automation and we're trying trying to pick and choose which type of automation to use one of the things that we talk about, like for example, this, this uh, com object to pick at a com object, great. But sometimes it happens that I need to go ahead and read the manual for that com object. Like for example, the MSDN manual of it, 
Well, and well, well that, that's really what I was going to say. Is, like, it is really yeah. consuming. Somebody's actually yeah. sharing their screen. I think Alan is actually sharing um, how it looks, how the, the tool actually looks for picking inside a com object. I'm not really sure if that's what it is all about. I mean, yeah. So, so Joe, that's not quite what I was talking about. That's part okay. of it. Okay. Um, this this, uh, this tool I had made um, actually generates a whole auto hotkey class um, with links to um, mm, documentation. So it creates the class. Okay. It creates the class and adds links for every function for where the documentation is. Okay, that sounds that sounds amazing, actually. Uh, so I'm sorry. Do, do, do you get the, the the information from the MSDN documentation and then convert it into AutoHotKey script? No, I don't pull it. From, I, I don't pull the um, class. Oh, like like the code out and of that. You just you just add the interfaces for it. Uh, I I just I I, I literally pull the. Uh, the interface for its methods mm -hmm. and properties. Uh, so uh, that sounds like I'll, a very I'll, I'll find out. I'm going to find a copy awesome. of it here. Awesome. Yeah, that I'll, sounds good. I'll make sure to add it to this page that I mentioned and maybe take and, you know, at some point we'll make a video uh, walking through how to use it. So it does sound but pretty awesome. I, I, I'm on the page now and I see here download com inspector tool by alchemist and i think that is the one that tank uh, mentioned and also download win 32 uh, classic com class from tank so i think it's already on their page oh the alchemist one okay so r is the one that um okay yeah i remember alchemist I had... without the gui i think it's the same guy okay <laughs> Okay, so Eric is saying that you can use something called reflection to detect the interface of a com object or .NET assembly. So that is that is a very interesting uh, tool. I will take a look at it later. Are you um, going to reflect on it? <laughs> maybe I will reflect on it. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that now. Uh, most of the times, if if we, uh, in general, as we mentioned, we prefer the com objects or UIA library and stuff or APIs, but if we have to spend a lot of time researching how to do something in that com object, then that is not the best solution for your tool. Sometimes you need the tool done and you have to keep in mind that you're gonna give the tool to the person and maybe that person is gonna be maintaining the code. It's not you, so they're gonna maintain the code. If they have no idea about com objects or APIs, they will be calling you back and saying, hey, uh, the tool is not working anymore, or I have to fix this. So sometimes not only the speed or reliability is a factor, but also who is going to be keeping that code? Who is going to be maintaining that code? The person has to know the way that you're using. If you're using Comb, they should be at least familiarized with Comb because if they want to maintain the code, they should know what they're doing, right? Um, so that is another thing that I usually take into consideration when I'm actually trying to figure out which way I want to use to um, uh, to uh, go ahead and automate a specific task. Which approach to use? Yeah. Yes. Right. Actually, in general, what was the, is there any approaches that you have used that you said that was the best solution for that particular problem? Is there anything that you have done like, no, I know that I cannot change this one. Like, this is how it goes forever. <laughs> is there anything, because I, I had that one time uh, <laughs> that I, I was actually working with a specific a program and we thought that making HTTP requests was the best way, right? We, we thought that that was the way to go because usually HTTP requests you know, an API, awesome. But then we figure out that actually having access to the local database that was in the computer was way better. So I just connected to the local database and I well, said like, nah, you know, I don't have to do HTTP requests anymore. That was what actually, you know, the stuff that we did the other day for our tool, you know, the automator is on a WordPress website, right? And the tool we're using, Easy Digital Downloads, has an API available where you can ping and get results. And so does, there's actually a whole different API type that you can do 
to interact with WordPress. And so you can program out new stuff and depending on the extension you're using, they might have an API or not. But then I realized, wait a minute, all of WordPress is a MySQL database. And from working with, with Maestrieth, once we, we figure out how to connect to a MySQL database with AutoHotKey. And now we just do SQL queries instead of going through the API and they're lightning fast. And it's a crazy how much data you can get, you know, so reliably and using SQL so we can easily tweak our query right dynamically it's oh it's so amazing but yeah it was a it was a really big aha of like you know what <laughs> that is right that is right um i saw eric mentioned the inspect.exe um is that the one i don't think that's what um uh mage was referring to or for a com inspector Um, the other th interesting thing I thought of was, uh, I think what happened when we were having our call with Descalada was the, the UI approach, it's, I assume technically an API, but it kind of bridges the gap between the two. But the one thing I love about the UI uh, approach is once you learn how to really use that well, it, unlike you don't have to most tools, not all, but most tools these days are going to have that backbone available, right? Where you can do stuff to it. Unlike with COM, you got to hope there's a COM object, or maybe there's an older program that has controls that we can interact with, which is if you have an older program, controls are amazing, right? That you can interact with them and do stuff with them. But yeah, yeah the, the UI, A, it's, it's kind of a blend to me between the two, because you're really only able to replicate what the human can do, right? Even though you're programmatically doing it. Yes, and, and UIA is just uh, an interface for accessibility functionality on a program. Um, so basically, in the end, you are imitating a human to some extent, not all, because, for example, there are some things that when you're, and this is something that you have to keep in mind if you're using UIA to automate stuff, um, some controls, they do not really exist until you click on the GUI to show them. So when the GUI is shown, then the controls exist in certain situations is like that so and and actually you, you you mentioned something very interesting last time that we were doing an example of uh the automating uh spotify's uh, uh interface and when you click on a checkbox when the checkbox switched to the checked state it was one control and when it switched to the unchecked state it was a different control so there's a few weird things that happen when you're using the UI automation that is not the same. For example, when you're using a control click or click on a specific location on the, on the window. So if you do that, clicking on a specific location, the location is always the same, right? <laughs> but when you're using UIA, the control itself can change to something totally different. So you have to keep track of those little details. And that's what makes the learning curve to some of the options that we have, the automating options, more difficult than others or not fit to what you're trying to do. Because sometimes it is not fit. You mm -hmm. might not use UIA in certain situations. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what are situations that I might choose, pick and choose? And I think, Joe, we discussed this a little bit uh, a while ago about for example, what happens if I have restrictions in my computer in which I cannot download certain libraries, right? So we have uh, Rufadium as a very nice library to control Chrome, for example, and Edge. Um, and Firefox. But, yeah, and Firefox and most, uh, you know, the browsers. But the thing is that that library downloads an executable file that is the uh, kind of like the web dri the driver for that particular um, application. What happens if I cannot download that executable because I'm at work or something like that, and they have restrictions on that? So even though that is a very good automation approach for a browser, I might be restricted, and I will have to pick another way of automating that. That's the reason why it's good to know the different ways how we can automate. And actually, I think that's what the link is all about, right? So the, the ways to automate, you have different ways that you can pick and choose about how to automate certain tasks. and the point is 
when would you choose one over the other? So. Yeah, and, and an interesting one came up just yesterday. I think it was during the live call where someone was trying to automate a uh, healthcare database type thing. And yeah. roughly after two minutes through it, they're like, oh, did I mention it's on a Citrix, you know, um, computer? So <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, that kind of changes, you know, everything. everything. <laughs> that is right. However, what I was saying too is you can, you know, we've had it with a client of ours. They were able to actually put auto hotkey on the remote computer and we could put our code there. So you can, there is a chance, right? Like you can do stuff. It, the second you hear Citrix, my point is don't think, okay, now I have to do image search or sending mouse clicks or maybe tabs or whatever, right? There, there are possible alternatives. Um, maybe like maybe the, you can do HTTP requests even, right? Or whatever, right? Or a SQL database. There, there might be a different way to connect to that same database that's behind the Citrix thing that you're using. Uh, not oh, always, but it's possible. That is right. Uh, I'm sorry to interject here. I, I see this question about building a GUI from XML. And what happens is uh, in other languages like C Sharp and uh, other more, more newer languages, allow you to create a GUI interface from an XML structure. And probably the question is, is there any ways to generate GUIs from that? Right now, for so as this is not related to the main topic of automation, I'm, I might give you the answer a little bit later, but just to tell you, a lot of things like this, building tools, tools to create a GUI, you, you can automate that. <laughs> so you can actually create a script that reads your auto hotkey, uh, code and just creates it into an XML that could be used somewhere else. Um, and again, here we go with the approaches of automating that. I could definitely just go read the file line by line, but I could use other ways of doing that, like, for example, the XPath library to actually generate an XML. So again, for different type of tools that or different types of automation that you're trying to do, just reading a file and actually converting it into a different language. You might use different approaches, like just simply creating a template and just putting the stuff in it, or using a com object or a library that generates XML from already existing, uh, you know, code. Um, in your case, I would say like right now in AutoHotKey, there is no tool that does exactly what you're asking for. But it's not that it's difficult to do it. It's just reading the GUI command and just expressing that as an XML rather than just a line of code. Yeah. That's all. And I can tell you, and I know Maestro is still on here, but um, he, we've made crazy complex GUIs based on data that's in XML. But but to right, that's how AutoHockey um, AHK Studio actually works. Everything is based on XML, which. Sadly, now knowing what I know, I would have probably used something different, but XML was what I knew at the time. Um, the entire GUI, uh, resizable, the whole nine yards is done through XML. It's built using XML, all of the sizes, what types of controls, everything is dictated and driven by the XML file, but it's all backed by standard um, auto hotkey GUI commands that create the uh, the controls, the edit controls or the check boxes or whatever buttons and all of that stuff gets built from the XML, but there's no easy way to do it. Like just, oh, you know, here's my XML, make it work. Just no, exactly. And I think you, like you have played with C Sharp as well. So probably you are, familiar with the with oh the, yeah c sharp uses something called xaml x a m l exactly. right or a uh, yeah x a m l but that's basically honestly i started writing it or writing uis without the xaml and just you know creating it from like you would normally do in auto hotkey with your gui comma add comma whatever and they basically have that same facility. It's just not as um, it, it's not as easily structured. But once you get into it and you learn that, oh, hey, I can completely from whole cloth make a dynamic GUI that 
just is not possible using XAML because everything is hard coded. You don't yeah. want to have that if your data structure or the, um, the particular use of your application may change depending on what the particular, um, what the user is doing at that particular time. And you don't want to create 17 trillion different pages of code for all of this other thing. You just want to be like, okay, let's make this reactive. Let's say, all right, they're doing this. Well, with, you know, 30 lines of code, I can completely rearrange this entire user interface to get the data that I need so that I can then go back to where I was without having to spin up an entire new window, this, that, and all the other, just do it in code and be done with it. It's so much easier. That is right. Now, and this is the other thing. If you use the correct data structure, which we will talk about a little bit later, we have a section for that. Um, we, if you have the correct data structure, you can make automating your own uh, script a little bit easier, not only for yourself, but for other people, because then we can just access the data structure that you have set up and we can actually use that to automate whatever we need. And probably we'll see a little bit more of that later on when we talk about data structures again. Now, I, I see that um, Charlie uh, Tank, you're actually sharing your screen. Yeah, so <clears throat> first of all, uh, I, I mentioned that it generates a script with documentation. Um, and, and so I wanted to wanted to show an example of what that looks like. So uh, but the, the point was, if I'm going to generate when I, when I was putting this together originally, the, the and, and this is not done, guys. Um, <laughs> nowhere near to the level I want to go to. But uh, if I'm going to generate a class for someone who doesn't know how to do it themselves, um, I need to provide them some some information about what that actually means. So, you know, the, the fact that we're pulling a lot of this stuff directly from the registry and stuff is, is really important and some fundamentals about com. I put links right there for them so they know what they're looking at and why. Awesome. Um, but you know, this was an Internet Explorer application, so it generated this um, this iWeb Browser two class because that's the interface right. name, right? So I've got an address bar. I've got you know, um, I, I just pre-built links to the to the Google searches that are you know um, probably uh, most likely to give give you the results that you really want so they don't have to figure out what to search for or anything um but the um yeah so so like uh this was this is some of the garbage that i i have to take out right um there, there, there's there's still some some garbage being written to this but um, no, but this looks really good. So basically what, what it does is that it reads the information directly and then just returns this, uh, this code, which I would use kind of like a template to start with and then later on just modify it to, according to what I need. But this is a yeah. very good start. Well, that's the point is for it to be a starting point. But yeah. the, the, um, the other thing that I was going to uh, point out here um is like i went ahead and 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 a, a, you know like a next step is to get the actual parameter names uh -huh. but like it knows which ones are optional and which ones right. aren't yeah. already right. we're already context aware of that um and, and uh so these uh and these descriptions come straight out of what's already part of the um uh com interface for these that um, looks amazing that's that looks great actually so i'm not i'm you know and and it takes a second or two to generate a class right mm -hmm. um but um this, so. this looks awesome this is a very good tool that when i'm trying to automate a few more things like i would take a look at that later on yeah so, so, so 
go ahead. No, I was just going to ask. Uh, so whenever you, you in particular, are trying to automate the task for uh, uh, a client or for yourself, how do you choose which, which tool or which way of uh, automating? How do you choose which way of automating you're going to be using? How do you? You mean like, yeah. do I? Do you use Calm? Like, like when you're making the decision of using Calm or actually using uh, another way of automating something, how do you actually go about it? What is the first thing that you check? The, all right, well, I mean, first it comes down to, uh, after I've backed up and, and walked through the process in detail with them and we've refined what that process is first, um, and assuming I have picked auto hotkey as the best tool for the job, um, then my next approach is to walk down this path of which applications have COM interfaces and <laughs> so you um, always favor come on top of everything always okay so and and, and somebody was asking what is come automation <laughs> so right right say right, that, what, right what that is yeah we actually oh, have so 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 that's that's what this is for oh the come fundamentals there yeah i'd still say though for for people who aren't programmers right mm -hmm. it think of it like how you know how vba you can programmatically interact with Excel. That's what you're doing. It's it's a way to allow you to use AutoHotKey to programmatically control a given program. It's it's from Microsoft. It's a component object model. It's built into a ton of their programs, and uh, it's just if it has it, you can programmatically control that program, right? Yeah. That's yeah. The... And 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 so that that, so, that last so... thing that he said. I'm sorry, Anthony. Exactly what you just said. It is like an API but for a desktop computer is the, the, okay. the, the original APIs, by the way. Well, I was going to say, not a website. So, no, not a website so, API, but just the original one. <laughs> so, so I'm going to phrase that a little differently because uh, <laughs> so the, the component object model, okay, it, it's a model. It is um, language agnostic, number one, okay? Once I have an, the only thing that's different from language to language is how I instantiate the interface. Yeah. Whether I'm going to use create object in VB or uh, com object create, whatever. Uh, the only difference is how I instantiate the object. After that, the, the com object model applies to how I apply. Uh, you know, references to child objects and properties, etc. cetera. Um, the, the next thing is, is that um, COM is nothing more than a standard for exposing uh, programmer uh, intended interactivity from a programmatic level with their application. It, what it does is basically establish a kind of server for a running application mm -hmm. or a DLL that allows you to send requests to it and have it re respond. Um, and it is a checkbox in Visual Studio to enable. Right. <laughs> no, I would rephrase that. If you're not a programmer and might find those words a little bit confusing, just think of it as a translator. That's how I would definitely put it. So, that, 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 that is a much better answer. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it is just like you have a, a program reading in C++, the COM object model, which is what you were referring to, would act as a translator between your language, which is in this case, auto hotkey, it would translate the auto hotkey code into the functions that were defined in C++ and the other way around. And it doesn't matter which language you're using, the com object model is basically kind of like a language that all of us can speak. 
That's what it is. And it's exactly what you said, uh, Charlie, that it is language agnostic. It doesn't matter which yes. language you're using. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, so far as your language can create a COM object, it would automatically allow you to use that object. It doesn't matter in which language it was created. Well, so, just, yep. yeah. So there's, so there's a difference in creating a com object in say Python, right? And yeah, yeah. After different. that, after that, I still, you know, you know, walk down the tree, you know, yeah. worksheets, workbook, or workbook, worksheets, cells. Um, well, it's just the know. creation. When you use a DLL call, you are programming in that other language, right? That's why they're so, for, for most of us humans that aren't programmers, so <laughs> difficult because you're like, what is this crazy crap I got to provide to it, right? <laughs> well, I need to learn C sharp and figure out what it goes in there. If you're using COM, you don't have you don't to care about that. it. Yeah. That's the it's, it's, it becomes standardized. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so COM gave us a standardized approach to developing a, a way to interact with applications. Now, now, uh, before that, and actually, this is one another way that we used to automate programs. Before the COM object model, we had sending messages to Windows. So, if you are an AutoHotKey programmer, you will see the send message and post message commands, and mm -hmm. all the Windows actually listen to these messages all the time. And one way, and very reliable way, by the way, of automating a program is sending in. The, the messages that it could understand. The only problem with that approach is that you would have to figure out which messages that program understands, and that is not an easy feat, <laughs> especially if they do not have documentation that specifies which messages they listen to. Now, that way of automating has fallen from favor. So right now we are more used to and prefer using com objects because it is a little bit more intuitive and it you don't have to send a numeric message like 234 i don't know what that means uh, in our in, in com objects you use functions or methods that are named in a very intuitive way so it is easy to follow um, but again if you do not have a com object available and you cannot use uia and you don't want to send keystrokes hey Let's try to send a direct message to that message to that particular control or to that program, and you might get the result that you're looking for. So again, there are always different ways to automate stuff. Some of them might need a little bit more work to understand. Sending messages definitely is going to take a lot more work to understand that com objects. By the way, just so you know. Yeah, uh, Isaiah, I. I, I... I have said a version of what you just said many times, but I think it's really important to understand that everything in a GUI based operating system, Linux included, can be reduced to its most simple interactions with post and um, send uh, message commands. Um, everything. Yeah, which is a really important thing tank to remember when it, and it gets back to if you're doing something where it's going to be used a lot over and over and you need to be reliable but there doesn't seem to be a com object or some other programmatic way to do it often through some work you can figure out a way to programmatically interact with it right and there there used to be a tool i i don't know if it's still out there i i, I haven't looked in, in a long time but there used to be a tool called and it was produced by microsoft called winspector spy yeah, I still yeah. and it, it would actually yeah. and 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 it would and it would uh, track and log all of the posts and send messages. Yes, yeah, I remember that too. <laughs> and that's what I used to to kind of like figure out some programs uh, a while back. Now it is not easy because there are thousands. No, of no, messages. there is a severe learning curve. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of the funniest videos. If you go search for it on Isaiah's channel from like. 11 or 12 years ago it's one of the it's why i knew who he was in the first one hk toots right is his channel right yeah you had the, it was even back when youtube wouldn't allow you like videos longer than 15 minutes or whatever because yes, you had that, break that, sections. Yeah. um <laughs> and in the video you're like hey look at this and then the you know the craziness of all this updates were happening and you're like yeah you got to filter these uh, yeah. yeah you get thousands and thousands of messages a second so they are 
just running around. So it is, it is again, what I mentioned, is not really a, a simple way to start to do stuff, but it is effective. Actually, uh, yesterday we were talking to to Thomas. I don't know if he's around. About you know, he is trying to figure out when you have text selected under the mouse or whatever. And he, one of the methods that he uses is that he detects whether the control right now is an edit control. And what he does is that then he sends the copy message to it instead of sending control C. Somebody was saying, uh, I think Geek Dude was saying recently that he had an issue with an application seeing control C as a non-standard way. So if you can send the copy, the WM copy message to that window, you probably can get exactly the same result without sending the control C command to it. So again, it's just a matter of what message you're really sending when you do control C. That's yeah, all. or or like detecting universally drag and drop or uh, things like that. Um, yes. The there was there was um, message from Eleni. There was something else that you know I, I find a an incredibly useful message and always seemingly overlooked tool <laughs> for are you giving a message. Are you Jake? Um, yeah, you know, somebody writes automations on their phone to make sure they don't miss message certain from messages Eleni. from people. And, message from Eleni. Um, message from Eleni. Yeah, I, I automate my phone too. Um, <laughs> okay, that's a good one. I, I, I automate everything um, yeah. if I can. Um, you know, why not? Um, but uh, so there, there's, there's a... Um, uh, a, a tool that that, um, that people do, either don't know exists um, or um, or are not aware uh, of it or... Or, or not aware of it. Uh, yeah. And my brain is going blank. Steps recorder. That's the one. Oh, the yeah. steps recorder. Yeah, yeah. That's the steps recorder from Windows. So, right? Yeah, it's part of Windows. Every version of Windows since XP. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, 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 and 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 people do not realize how powerful this is. So I can make this capture up to you know some number of steps, right? I can say capture the screen or not, depending on the privacy necessary. Mm -hmm. I prefer to capture the screen. I can choose an output file location. You know, um, okay. Now, uh, you know what? Next time, I, I, you know what? What I what you just mentioned might be a way of automating certain uh programs because I could do the steps recorder and try to read the steps recorder's file and convert them into into uh, auto hotkey actions and probably automate a program that way. I will take a look into that at some point and add it to our ways, uh, one of our well, 17 yeah, so, ways of automating so, a program. <laughs> so, so this is really this is really a quick way to gather information yeah. from a client, right? Or, yeah. or you know, what's yeah. going right or wrong because, so check this out. I, I, I told it to record, right? And I'm, I'm just, I'm going to click a couple of random things. Okay, doesn't matter. Right. And then I'm gonna hop back over here. I could add comments with each step. I can. Uh, oh no, I didn't hit report. Sorry. Um, but so I can do the back button. Yeah. Right? Stop record. Right. So the the the. Yeah. Uh, why did it not? Prompt me sure. just now. I, I think I think he's not sharing the screen. Right. But. Now, now, here's the thing. Now, when we're automating stuff, we we would at some point see if we could use the the steps recorder, but I think we're gonna show that in a in a different uh, situation. Let's see if we can answer this last one, this last question, because we're five minutes into the next topic. That like, do you as AHK experts successfully use APIs that require authorization? OAuth and access token and so on with AutoHotKey. I find it very difficult. The developer documentation is usually not easy. Blah, blah, blah. Um, they are usually based on other languages. And we 
he was watching the webinar and stuff and you know he was trying to connect to other apis now i'm going to answer that question really quickly uh, because we have a few minutes yes we have been able to successfully use tokens and connections the easiest way i have noticed and it is good that it's getting traction online is using the jwt tokens that's a, for example the zoom api uses this in which they give you a jwt and every time you make a, an http request you pass that token in your request um but the oauth which is the one that you were referring to you just have to think of it as steps you have to make one request to get a token and once you get that token you make another request to get authorized and after you do that then your authorization is working if you think about the the authorization process as two steps instead of one it might be a little bit easier sometimes to get the idea but people are moving away from that type of authentication they're going to be using the jwt which is extremely simple to understand just take a look at the zoom app uh, the zoom api uh, to see how it works and uh, later on, we could give you an example of that as well. Yeah, let's let, let take a little step back just to clarify. So there's web service APIs and there's APIs, right? And, and actually, mm -hmm. I love how Tank earlier talked about if you think about Palm as a lot more like a, a, a server that you can connect to and, and interact questions with it, then it, it actually APIs in general all are similar. It makes right? sense. Yeah. But the web service APIs, which is what he's asking about, is you know, you're connecting to a service online and you're doing queries to another a server somewhere, right? Um, Maysruth and I, like we did the years ago, we did the Amazon product lookup and we spent, Maysruth, I don't know if you're still there. Uh, we spent a good five, six hours working through the stupid OAuth 2. Now there's also a big difference between the OAuth 1 and OAuth 2, right? right. OAuth 1, Five minutes, you're done, right? Like it's so easy. OAuth and OAuth one is really, hey, I'm a developer. I have a tool. I'm going to run it from this computer. I'm not giving it to people to have on their phone to use with their accounts, right? There's, it's much simpler. The OAuth two, crazy more complex. 100% agree. And, and to Zayce's point, everyone does them differently. And so you solve one, and then you go to the next one, and it's it's all totally fun. different. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it. I think not, the other th important thing to remember is. You know, every browser call when you're using your browser and you hit a server, that's an API call, right? So often, and this is what was great about IE, you could use the XML HTTP request, log in with IE, and then connect to that version and do API calls, your XML HTTP calls from there using your credentials from the browser, which was so easy. Um, and then we looked at doing this with some other tools, like even uh, Auto Control and in um, Chrome.hk and Refidium, and it was... Auto control, there was no problem, right? Or no, we still had a problem. It was detecting. It, it was diff it's difficult. Yeah. Actually, it's really difficult. Now, now the point is, uh, what I would say, very way, something very good. We are moving away from Auth two to the new JWT. So, if you have time, just read about it. And if you're actually connecting to services that are on the web, it's very likely that they have they are already having an option for that or they will soon be switching because it is so simple and so secure that people are going to be saying like, we don't have to deal with O2 anymore. <laughs> like, I don't want to deal with that anymore, right? So um, let's let's cut, we're on our time break. So let's stop. And now I know why Isaac was bringing up because he's presenting. So let's <laughs> stop here. Um, so.